God bless you on this morning. God has given you the ability to awake and arise. He has given you the ability to stand and to see. He has given you the ability to hear, touch, and smell. If you're able to stand up this morning and stretch your arms in glory to God, then you ought to say amen. amen. We ought to be thankful for the little things because in being thankful to the little things to God, it makes us able to deal with the bigger things. And as we enter into uh, our worship service this morning and we have had the ability to pray to God, seek his forgiveness. We've had the ability to make a uh, psalm and praise to an almighty God. God is now ready that the word might be preached. And so as we have looked at the text uh, and the one who had the responsibility to read for you the text, uh, it, it is drawn out of uh, the uh, Old Testament scriptures. And it comes to us from Deuteronomy chapter 6. As way of background, we need to understand that uh, this book, uh, this book uh, was uh, given or written uh, by Moses, and that it is an insightful way of instructing uh, those Israelites uh, that were not a part of uh, the exodus out of Egypt. But these were those that were drawn out uh, of the children of Israel who had made exodus from Egypt but had failed to obey God. And in the midst of wandering in the wilderness, uh, these are they or the fruit of those that actually made the exodus out of Israel. And Deuteronomy means a second time, a second giving of the law. And uh, before they are about to embark into the promised land, and Moses, of course, is not going to engage in this travel with them because of his own disobedience, but he wants to remind them of the law that was given to him and to Israel uh, uh, upon their uh, exodus at Mount Sinai. The second generation is given instruction, given instruction of their place and their relationship with God. Amen. See, this is important for us, church, uh, as we embark on becoming followers of Christ, as we embark in being Christians, we have to understand how God works. Amen. And if we understand how he worked in the Old Testament, we can translate that to understand how he's going to continue to work in the New Testament. Because God does not change. It is we as men that change our nature. We as women that change our nature and change uh, what we do, what we wear, how we live. But God does not change. And so in looking at uh, the text in uh, chapter 6, uh, there is some insightful information. Uh, when we look at uh, the text uh, in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6, it elicited us to understand uh, that primary uh, importance uh, is the idea of teaching our young people, and the role that the father has in the household of setting the tone, setting the tone. Mom has a very important role as well, but if you look at the relationship between God and human beings, and you look at creation, and you see that God created man First, Amen. man has a vital, important role 
in the household as being a husband. And so uh, for uh, a subject of our text, uh, it's called fatherhood. Fatherhood, a teachable moment. Fatherhood, a teachable moment. The text reads as such. It says, now this is a commandment and these are the statues and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess. Amen. That you may fear the Lord your God and keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you, Amen. you and your son and your grandson, and all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. Therefore, hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you. Amen. And that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God Amen. with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Amen. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and you shall be, you shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Amen. A few points I want to make. In this text, the text elicits us to look at it from five or four points. Number one, love God. Number two, teach your children. Number four, number three, place God's principles as a first priority. And number four, put God's principles in viewable locations in your home. Let's talk about the text for a moment. Looking at verses one uh, through three, it is almost as a preamble or as a thesis of what uh, the main point is of this text. Number one, God is God. Amen. God is God. God has all authority. Did we make ourselves? Did we make this planet? Did we make all the things on this planet? And so therefore, God is God, and God makes things for his pleasure. Amen. And therefore, if he is God, then therefore we are his children or subjects or the things that he has made for his purpose. And he selected a select group of people. The text says, now this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded 
to teach you. Amen. Who is he talking about? He's talking about the house of Israel, the children of Jacob, Abraham's seed. Translate that to the New Testament. Those who follow and obey Christ were adopted into Abraham's seed. And so therefore, if we see this in the Old Testament and God has given us some precepts to follow and obey, he wants to teach us. He wants to teach us his word. But notice what it says. Command. And these are statues and judgments. Three words, commandments, statues, and judgments. You can look at commandments as being the law or ordinances or code of law. The statues are those things within the code that dictate how the law should be interpreted. And then the judgments are those things that come as a result of you disobeying the law. Amen. All of these things are dictated in God's word for the Israelites to learn because God is going to teach them. He says, Lord, your God has commanded to teach you that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over. See, what was translating from Moses to these individuals is the law. And he is instructing them that they are to follow the commandments in which he had given their fathers and their fathers had disobeyed. But in this second giving of the law, they are to obey it, and in doing so, they won't be punished, but they would be blessed. Amen. They would be blessed. Because if you continue to read the text, beginning in verse number three, it says, Therefore, hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you. A land flowing with milk and honey. Amen. You want to do well? You want to be prosperous? Obey what God says. Live a godly life. One that is full of the fruits of the Spirit. Translate your sinful state where you used to be a reveler and a, a disobedient child and you used to go out every night and hang out with your friends cussing and fussing. But now you're a child of God and you spend time here with your fellow brothers in Christ Amen. helping those that have needs, serving not only one another, but serving the community in general. Amen. And so, you have to be transformed. Yes, and that transformation process comes through obeying God's word. You can't get into Christ without being obedient. Faith cometh by what? Hearing. Hearing. Hearing by the word of God. Amen. And so the idea here in verse number one through three is God is giving them instructions. He is going to teach them his statutes and his commandments and his judgments. And they are to obey it. And in doing so, when they go into the promised land, they will be prosperous and they will grow not only in number, but in understanding of God's word into a land flowing with milk and honey. Right. Now that's the, the second generation. 
But what about those that are going to come behind them? How are they going to ensure that God uh, remains first place? How are they going to ensure that after God gives the commandment to them and they obey, how are they going to ensure that those that come behind them, their children, their grandchildren, and their grandchildren's children, and their grandchildren's children's children's children, how are they going to ensure that the next generation remains faithful? Amen. Fathers, stand up. Fathers in this room, stand up. It ain't Father's Day, but we're talking about fathers. Fathers in this room, if you are a father, stand up. You have a responsibility to ensure that your household understands this book called the Word of God. You are head of your household, just as Christ is head of the church. And as a result, you may be seated, as a result of that responsibility, you have to be able to teach your children. Yeah. God doesn't leave you without instructions. In verse number four uh, through number 10, he gives some insightful words as to how we are to teach. And all we got to do is do what he says. You don't have to be no rocket scientist. If you got third grade basic reading and comprehension, you can understand what God has for you to do as a man, as a father, in the house. The problem today is daddy ain't in the house. The problem today in our society is daddy is not in the house. See, daddy is a rolling stone, and wherever he lay his hat is his home. He's making babies everywhere. Ten kids, ten mamas. That's the problem. How can you have the structure that God has commanded? Husband and wife. Husband, leave your mother and father and cling to your wife. Amen. Not the first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one, the fifth one. One. That's the problem. Amen. And when we look at the structure of the household uh, in our community and in this nation, we have failed God All right. as a country because we have gone away from the principles in which he has commanded. Amen. And when you walk away from God, God's just waiting on you to come back. Amen. If my people would humble themselves, trying to be humble. Amen. We want to be like Mike. That's the problem, y'all. Maybe not with y'all, but y'all are my Lord. Yeah. And the question is, how do we change the mindset of the majority? Amen. We got to keep on plugging. Keep on. Keep on preaching. Keep on teaching. Yeah. Keep on believing and being faithful that God is able. Amen. When we look at this lesson, I got off script. When we get to this lesson, there are some principles. And if we teach those principles here in this building, we teach those principles in our household, we'll have strong households. Mm -hmm. And having strong households, hopefully we'll be able to influence those that are around us. Yeah, Remember, yeah. we're salt of the earth. Yeah. If the salt loses its savor, it has nothing to be done but to be thrown out and trodden over. We're light that can not, that's set on a hill that cannot be hid under a book. But we are to let our light shine before men that they may see our good works and that we may what? Glorify God. Let's get back to the lesson. And so when we look at the text, 
in verse number four, it says, Hear, O Israel. Uh, this word here is a celebrated word uh, from uh, Judaism in that it is considered Shema. It is the basic confession of those who follow Israel. It says, Hear. Here the word out of the Hebrew is Shema. The verse starts with a command for people to respond properly to God. See, when God says hear, he's commanding you to listen to what he is about to say. Amen. That's the problem today. We ain't trying to hear. All right. We hear everybody else and obeying everybody else when we're not obeying God. Amen. And he's getting ready to tell those that are there, uh, this second generation, those who are the fruit of those who were disobedient out of the exodus of Egypt and wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Sound like we've been wandering. Mm. Sound like this text is uh, relevant to us in our time and age that we need to hear God. Amen. What is the first thing that God tells those people? Let's go to the text and see. He says, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Put God first place. Don't put him second place. Put God first place. Amen. God should be preeminent yes, in your life. If God is not preeminent in your life, uh, then you're going to have a problem uh, because God should be first place in all of our lives. And when we put God in first place, uh, then there is no problems with prioritizing what we ought to be doing. When you put God in first place and there is a football game that comes on at 11, uh, you know that you're going to miss the first quarter because you're going to be here at church until at least 12, okay? And when you put God first place, when the game comes on at 7 o'clock uh, Eastern time, uh, the National Basketball Association finals, uh, you will be here uh, uh, versus at your home watching uh, LeBron James uh, go against Curry. Uh, God is first place. Uh, when God is first place in your life, uh, when you have $10 and your bills are 20, uh, you know at least one of them dollars uh, plus a cent is going towards uh, the tithe. Uh, but when you're not putting God first, uh, you'll figure out how you're going to pay those $20 worth of bills with all of them $10 and still have nothing. Put God first. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15 says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things. In him all things consist, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may, be, may have preeminence. Put God first. Put Christ first in your life. And so you've heard not only from the Old Testament, but from the New Testament. The Lord is one. And then verse 5, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. Put God first. Love God. 
Love God. If you understand how to love God, then you can understand how to love me. First John talks about that. How can you say you love God whom you not seen and hateth your brother who you see every day? John said, you a liar. Mm. <laughs> you got to love me, your brother, before you go around talking about loving God. All right. And if you love me, then you can love God. And you love God, you can love me. Amen. That's all right. And then verse number six, and then this is here where we get into the commands. Verse number six and says, uh, and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Uh, where is your heart? It is your mind. It's not this thing that beats and pumps blood, but God says he will write his word in your heart. And so we have a responsibility to know God's word. Amen. How many of you can memorize scripture? Not just memorize it, but internalize it in that what you remember, you understand, and you know how to apply it in your lives. Amen. That's what God is talking about, that he shall uh, place on your heart his commandments. And then, here as men is our priority. You shall teach them diligently to your children. Men, in our households, we have to have time to sit down with our children and not only be an example to them and showing them that we are timely in our responsibility to attend a worship service, to participate in all the functions that go on uh, here at this congregation, and not only show out in terms of coming to uh, our congregational functions, but living a godly life Amen. before your children. Amen. And see, I remember a story as a child. Uh, my mama uh, told me uh, well, the door had rung. The door had rung, and she didn't want to deal with who was at the door. And she told me, Ashley, uh, whoever's at the door, don't open it. Never open up doors for strangers. I understand, Mom. But when you get to the door, I want you to tell them, uh, I'm not here. I did exactly what she told me. My mama say she ain't here. See... We have to live a godly example. Better off not even saying nothing. <laughs> but see, when you put examples like that before your children, you're teaching them to lie. And I'm sure my mama wasn't the only one that did that. That's why y'all laughed. Y'all might have did that yourselves. Or, or the bill collector call. Uh, she's not here. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. And, and so we have to teach them diligently to our children. Not just in word, not just talking. But we have to live a life that is godly before them. I remember in looking at my father, who is now deceased, uh, but uh, when Sunday came around, he would tell us, look, son, now I have some pancakes, I have some eggs, and I have some bacon for breakfast. And I know you like that alaga syrup on your pancakes. I say, yes, dad, I sure do. Where my plate? Well, before you can have your plate, you need to quote for me the 23rd Psalm. Look. That was some, some um, insightful lessons because uh, you know me, uh, I ain't fan. I learned the 23rd Psalm in record time. Yeah. The bottom line is uh, you, sometimes for some kids you have to do things differently, but the bottom line is you have to teach them God's word. Amen. 
You have to sit down with them and encourage them. You have to live a godly life before them. And in doing so, they will see God in you and emulate you. I can remember as a child, I wanted to emulate my daddy so bad. He had size 13 uh, Florsham wing tips. He, he had office job. And he'd leave them uh, at uh, the foot of his bed. Uh, he had several pair. And when he wasn't there, I'd take my little foot and put him in there and try to be him. And see, your children are watching you. Amen. Fathers, your children are watching you. And they want to emulate you. And you want, they want to become like you. And so you have to be a good example for them to emulate. Because if you give them a bad example, they're going to take that and run with it. Assuming that that's the way to act. And so as godly men, we have to give them godly examples. And so you shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall talk to them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. I believe it is Proverbs uh, 22 in verse 6 that says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now notice, teach, train, teach, train. When you talk about teaching, you're really talking about training, because a teaching is a form of training. Training, when you, you can, the best example of training you can see is when these athletes get ready for football season. They have two a days. They get up early in the morning before the sun rises. And they're running around the field uh, doing all types of exercises and drills. Uh, and then they have a second practice that is during the evening time uh, as the sun sets and they're under the light. And they're doing more training and more drilling and getting practice in. So when the season comes, they know the plays. They have the endurance to go through all four quarters of the game. They know the assignments, both on the offense and the defense. And they've memorized and become acquainted with the players on their team so they can work as a unit uh, together to win the game. They got one goal, to win the game. We in the Church of Christ have one goal. One goal. And that is to share the gospel right. with every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Our job is to take what God has given us, obey it, and to go out and live godly lives before those who know not Christ and become written epistles uh, communicating God's ordinances to them by the example that you and I live as Christian brothers and sisters in the Lord's Amen. church. Amen. And so in order to do that, we got to train up our children. Amen. You got to sit down with them. You got to be examples to them. And you got to communicate your relationship with God so they understand how their relationship with God should be. So that scripture is right. Train up a child in the way he shall go. And when he grows older, he shall not depart from it because he's seen a good example in you. He's heard you talk about it. He's seen how you live in the down time or when you were down and out. You still remain faithful to God. And God saw you through because of your faith. So he understands that a relationship with God produces results. So when you live a mango seed kind of life, living paycheck to paycheck, and in between the paycheck going to the pawn shop, Amen. and doing everything you ought not be doing, and then blaming God for it, that's a mango seed kind of life. We need to live a glorious life Amen. for our Amen. children so they can see the good example and know how to carry themselves and conduct themselves. Amen. And then, therefore, it'll be an honor when we see them 
become baptized in Christ. Because we know he gave him everything that he could and he was offering God for us. That's all right. That's all right. Amen. Amen. And so when, when we look at uh, the scripture uh, and it says in verse number eight, uh, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. What we want to understand is uh, the Jews may have, in their interpretation, instructed to, to physically do this. They actually had what are called philosophies, which are boxes containing passages of scripture. And when they prayed, they put them over their eyes. The whole idea or principle is that you put God's word first place. Not that you physically put it on your eyelids, but they got to be in front of you. you. You have to use God's word uh, as Ephesians 6 describes as part of your toolbox, as part of your armor that you have on because this is not a physical war, but it is a spiritual war. And we have to be prepared for warfare. The devil is going to come after the men first, and then their entire household. Keep on living. Amen. He'll come after you, and he will try you. Because as we learned in our Sunday school lesson this morning, this is not God that tries us. Because God cannot tempt anyone. Amen. But it is the devil that does all of the trying. He tried Job, and he'll try you. Amen. And so you have to be prepared. You have to be clothed with the weapons for the type of warfare that you're fighting. Come on now, go to Ephesians chapter 6. Y'all don't believe me. You're going to make me go there. Go there. Ephesians. Chapter 6. Let's go there. Galatians, Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord, in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. Put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And above all, taking the shield of faith, uh, which you will be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one and take up the helmet of salvation. And there it is, the sword, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Amen. You got to have your word strapped on you, not physically, but spiritually. It's got to be written upon your heart that as you do battle, with the enemy. You're able to protect your family by being able to utter the word of God, just as Jesus did as he battled Satan when he was tempted three times after fasting 40 days. Amen. He battled Satan with the word of God. Men, if you want to protect your household, you have to pray hard. You have to read God's word hard, and you need to live for God hard. And when you do that, you 
will be able to instruct your children. As in verse 8 says, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. They can see you living a godly life. Verse number nine, last verse, as we close. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Here, the Jewish custom is to attach a small vessel called a Musa uh, to the doorpost. In it is placed a small scroll containing the text of Deuteronomy chapter 4 and 9. And, and it, what, it, it, what it does, what it does, once again, it shows that in your household, you are putting God first. Amen. Now, you don't have to take uh, a picture, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 through 9, and, and post it on your wall or your doorpost. I, I will tell you the best instruction to show them that you're putting God first is to just live a godly life before them. And when they see you living a godly life, fathers, and you putting God first in all that you do. Your time, your giving, your work, your efforts, they will know how to emulate you and that they will do the same thing. Right. And when we talk about having the next generation and the next generation and the next generation and the next generation obeying God, it begins today with this generation. Amen. And so that is our lesson today. Fatherhood, a teachable moment. We have to have teachable moments with our children every day. Now, many of you in this room may not have children in your household, but you got grandchildren that come by. Some of you even have great grands. You as a great-grandfather or a grandfather have opportunities to have teachable moments with your grandchildren. Amen. Sit down with them. Share the scriptures with them. Bring them to church with you yeah. so they can see you in action and how you relate to God. The lesson is yours today. Fatherhood, teachable moments. Put God first in your life. Love God with all your heart. Teach your children. Place God's principles as first priorities and put God's principles in viewable locations in your house, mainly by you being example to your children. God bless you. If you're here today and you are not a member of God's church. You're not a member of the Lord's church. Uh, you have not obeyed the gospel. Uh, today is the opportunity. Well. Don't waste a day. Today has 24 hours in it. We are in uh, the 11th hour of the day. Amen. You have lost uh, 11 hours up to this point. And so this is the opportunity and the time God has given you if you are not in the Lord's church to obey the gospel before it's everlasting too late. We don't know what tomorrow may hold. We don't know what the second, next second uh, in this hour may hold for us. We may get up and walk out of this building and fall dead. But if you fall dead in your sins, you have no hope. But in Christ, you have hope, uh, you have salvation, you have a new life in Christ Jesus. And for you to obtain this great salvation, there are five simple steps that you must do. Number one, you must hear the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You must believe what it says. 
He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. You must repent of your sins. I tell you nay, unless ye repent of your sins, ye shall all likewise perish. You must confess, your, you must confess uh, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then you must put Christ on in baptism. Amen. And once you have done those five things, you have been obedient to God. You are now in Christ, and you must remain faithful unto death. The opportunity is yours today. If you need salvation and you want to obey the gospel, uh, if you need prayer, you're a member of the Lord's church, our God commands us that we ought to pray to him. He says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, prayer and supplication, make your requests made known unto God. And then if you hear and you need to repent of your sins, meaning that you are a member of the Lord's church, but you lost your mind, you've walked away from God, and you decided to do things your own way. And recognizing that you are at fault, you decide to repent of your sins and ask God to forgive you of your sins. You can do that now as we all stand and sing the invitation song.